Picture this. You're standing in the glass goods aisle of a thrift store. You're staring at shelves and shelves of glass. Candlesticks, bowls, drinking glasses, picture frames. But you find out that among all of the glass is one fine leaded crystal piece. Are you able to pick it out? Can you tell the difference between plain old glass and the good stuff? If you do find the piece, will you be able to determine if it's vintage or antique? Ah, so many questions, but we have answers. In tonight's show, we are learning how to distinguish things from each other in Circa 19XX land. Oh, and uh, hey, there's more. I want to catch you up on what I've been watching, what I've been reading, and what's in my pool bag. What? <laughs> yeah, we're going to cover all the important stuff tonight. But before we get to it, Maestro, we need that theme song. Hit it! Hi there, this is Jennifer Passarello from Circa19XX.com. Welcome to Circa Sunday Night. Why don't you put on your flapper dress and a long strand of pearls and let's Charleston our way to Dreamsville. Hey, this show is the cure for insomnia. This show is Circa Sunday Night. Good evening. How nice that you've stopped by. Actually, how nice that you found your way to Circa 19XX land. You know, once you leave its borders, you can never return again. <laughs> well, no, that's not quite right. You can come back anytime if you can find your way here. That's the key. Yes, friends, you have made it to the most obscure and slowest growing podcast on the internet. And however you found your way here, welcome. So what's been happening since our last show? Well, for me, there's been a lot of pool time. That's what summer is to me. You know, I'm a pool person. If the sun is out and the temperature's 90 degrees or above, I'm probably going to be in the pool. In fact, as I'm sitting here right now, I'm looking at my pool bag, which is all packed up and ready for my next pool day, which is probably going to be in Orlando, Florida. Yes, it's that time again for me to head to my happy place, sunny, tropical Florida. And I have to say, um, I'm ready. I'm so excited. Now, when I look at this pool bag, I actually, this is a great reminder of Florida because I bought this particular bag in Miami, well, actually it wasn't Miami, it was Coral Gables, Florida, at the Biltmore Hotel gift shop. Yeah, oh, what a beautiful place that is. So glamorous. So old, not old world, I was going to say old world, but you know, like 1920s, 1930s. Um, so beautiful. But anyway, they have a hotel gift shop there, and this beautiful little bag was in that shop. Now, I talked about the Coral Gables Biltmore in an earlier episode, and I'm trying to think of what the name of that episode is. I think it was um, Old Old Florida, A Vacation in Old Florida, something like that. So it was something, uh, it was last year, 
And it was something like vacationing in old Florida or vintage Florida or some, something like that. I don't know. But anyway, um, you know, if you haven't heard that episode, let me just do a quick recap of Coral Gables Biltmore. So the Biltmore opened in the 1920s, and its heyday was between the 20s and the 40s. And at that time, it was one of the most fashionable resor uh, resorts in the country. And I can tell you, it's a stunner even today. You know, it has this huge tower. I think it's a bell tower. I, I don't actually know if there's a bell in there. I can't remember, but I do remember the tower because you could see it from far away. But I think my favorite feature of this beautiful hotel is their huge swimming pool. That pool is massive. And along one side of the pool are these beautiful statues. Really elegant and beautiful. I mean, you just don't see pools quite like that anymore. Oh, what a magical place. Oh, and you could eat lunch, which we did. We had lunch right there next to the pool. So glamorous and beautiful. Now, my little pool bag is kind of this uh, lightweight jute bag. It, it really doesn't weigh anything at all. But on the side of it, it has a beautiful imprint of the Biltmore Hotel there in Coral Gables. So I think of that pool every time I see it. Okay, so what all do I have in my pool bag? Should we do a little um, show and tell? Should we do, well, can you do show and tell um, in an audio only podcast? I think I have done that before. So, um, sure, why not? <laughs> Let's do a little what's in my bag segment. And, you know, honestly, I hadn't thought of doing that until right now. But I'm looking at the bag and we're talking about the bag. So why not? All right. Hang on for one second and I'm going to grab my bag. Okay, here it is. Got all my stuff in it. Okay, so what all do I have in here? Now, I should say, before we, we kind of dive into this bag, that I actually keep three pool bags. It just makes things very convenient. So I keep one here in Kansas City. I keep one in my home in Springfield, Missouri. And then I keep this one for when I go to Florida or really any southern you know, climate. I say southern because that's where I tend to go and where it's warm enough to swim. So I have my travel pool bag and then I have the two pool bags for, um, for at home. All of these bags pretty much have the same things in them. So let's dive in. And I have to say everything is so well organized right now because I just packed this bag. Of course, when you get to the pool, everything is in disarray. But right now, in this moment, everything looks very tidy and organized. Okay, so the first thing I have in my bag is my towel. Now, do I honestly take a towel with me when I go to a hotel? <laughs> yes, actually I do. I have just learned that it's handy to have my own towel. First of all, my towel is very large. It's an oversized beach towel. And generally when you use the hotel issue towels, they're smaller. The other thing is those towels all tend to be white or, you know, they're all very uniform looking. And my towel stands out because it's different. It, it happens to be, this one is a black and white stripe. And so I know my towel at a glance. It's just handy to have it. Now, also on this trip, I'm, I'm going to Orlando. But in addition, I do have a rental car, so I'm going to be driving to Sarasota, and I'm going to have a beach day, so I'm going to Siesta Key. For that that little beach road trip, I'm not really going to, well, I will take my towel. What am I saying? I'll take my towel for that, but also I'm going to take this little, um, this little mat. It's a, a beach mat. I don't know what this is made out of. It's not wicker. I keep wanting to say wicker, but it's like a grass mat. And you roll it up and you tie it up with a ribbon to keep it secure. And I actually bought this mat on Oahu on my last trip, just prior to COVID. I had gone to Hawaii and I bought this, uh, this little mat. It's really handy when you go to the beach because if you put your towel on the beach, it gets kind of gross. You know, there's sand in it and everything and you can shake your towel out. 
but the sand stays in there and it just kind of is a mess. So this little mat is a little bit more stable. The sand just falls right off of it when you pick it up off the beach and it's just very handy. So for this trip, I'm taking my towel and I'm taking my little um, roll up mat. Okay, so what else do we have in here? Well, we have my sunglass readers. So yes, you know, I bought these sunglass readers and I keep them in my pool bag as a just in case. You know, if I need to read something and I'm out in the sun, I have them here. However, what I have found is I almost never use them. I have these ideas that I'm going to go and sit by the pool and I'm going to read, right? You see people doing that all the time. I don't. I very rarely read at the pool because I like to swim in the pool. I'm not really spending a whole lot of time on the sidelines sitting and reading. So I don't really use these readers, but you never know. You may need them. Okay, so what else do we have in here? Goggles. That's something else I almost never use, but um, I have goggles in all three pool bags. Y you never know. <laughs> Always be prepared. I don't know. You know, I, I will say this. I like goggles because I can see underwater much better if I'm wearing them, but uh, I don't know. They're not very comfortable, so they're in here just in case I need them. Okay, now we get to the essential things that I really do need. Hair things. So I have here some hair clips. Yes, I've got several, actually, of these hair clips. And I have, what else do I have? Oh, I have an oversized hair pick with, um, you know, the wide set prongs. So that's pretty critical. I must have that, you know, to comb out my hair. And then also, very important, critical item for my pool bag, conditioner for my hair. So what I do is when I know that I am done swimming, I'm out of the pool. I'm not getting back into the pool. I'm just giving myself a chance to kind of dry dry um, off a little bit. Well, then I will comb conditioner through my hair. You know, chlorine can really do a number on your hair. And so I have found that if I condition it right then and there, when I, when I jump out of the pool, it, it just makes my hair so much healthier and softer. Now, there is a particular conditioner that I like for this purpose, and it's called Hask, H-A-S-K, Coconut Oil Nourishing Conditioner. This is very inexpensive, and I honestly found it at my local grocery store. Yeah, I was kind of desperate. I needed some conditioner, and so I picked this up, and I ended up loving it. So this is what I use now. Hask Coconut Oil Nourishing Conditioner. Now, not only does it condition my hair really well, but, and perhaps this is the most important factor here, it smells like coconut. It smells so good, and I love that coconut smell at the pool. You know, it sort of creates a tropical vibe, even when I'm here in the Midwest. You know, it's not very tropical here in Missouri, but when I'm at the pool, I could put that coconut oil in my hair and, um, oh, it just smells like you're in a cloud of coconut and it's just fabulous. So then, you know, I get home or I get back to the hotel room and I wash it out and uh, it's great. It's great for my hair. So I love that. Okay, what is left here? Oh gosh, more hair clips <laughs> and some ponytail bands. Yeah, so uh, gosh, there is just an awful lot of hair stuff in here, but you know, hair stuff is important when you're at the pool. Okay, so that's about it. And boy, this makes for exciting uh, podcasting, doesn't it? Going through my pool bag. Well, now you know what all my pool bag secrets are. Now, if you're new to uh, Circa Sunday Night, our little show is just filled to the brim with exciting things like this. Hey, you know what? I want to spend a little more time talking about the Coral Gables Biltmore because I recently found out something about the Biltmore that I didn't know when I was there. 
Now, when World War II started, the hotel was converted into an army hospital, and they really did a number on this beautiful place. They put linoleum everywhere, and they even sealed the windows with cement. What? <laughs> Why would they do that? There must have been a reason. I don't know. Anyway, it remained a hospital until 1968. Now, here's the part that I just found out. After 1968, it was completely abandoned. So it was just kind of sitting there empty. Here's a piece from an article on the Biltmore that was published out on, the, on uh, Miami's WLRN radio station website. They did a little story on it, and here's what it says. When the hospital closed in 1968, the Biltmore became an abandoned shell. That's when neighborhood kids started sneaking in. So many kids were sneaking in that the city of Coral Gables decided to hire a security guard. Kim Dunzoko, um, this is a gal who grew up in Coral Gables, she remembers sneaking into the shuttered building with her friends back in the day. Sneaking past the guard was part of the fun, she says. Once you got in, she explained, that's when it started to get a little creepy and quiet and creaky. In 1983, Coral Gables put $55 million into renovating the Biltmore. The hotel reopened in 1987 and was restored to its former glory. Ten years later, the Biltmore was added to the National Registry of Historic Places. Well, this just sort of blows my mind because it is far from creepy now. It's just absolutely beautiful. I mean, I can't even imagine... That lobby, for example, oh my goodness, what a stunner that is. I just can't imagine it being empty and dark and creepy. I just can't imagine it. So uh, I guess that just goes to show you, it's never too late to get in shape. <laughs> yeah, hope springs eternal. <laughs> take a peek into our listener mailbag and see what we've got in there. Okay, this is going to be a short segment because uh, there are no letters in the mailbag this time around. <laughs> but I do have some news on the YouTube front. This is exciting. The momentum is building over there. Now, you might recall that in our last episode, I gave a subscriber update and we were up to six total subscribers. We're at seven now. No, I am not making this up. You can go out there and verify my claim. Seven subscribers. If you've been listening for a while, you know that my goal for 2022 is to not lose subscribers. So that means I want to end the year with at least five subscribers because I had five subscribers when I made that goal. So as long as I end the year with five subscribers, I feel like I have accomplished something. And uh, now we're building a bit of a cushion there, which is kind of cool. Now, if you're listening to this show, you are almost certainly listening via Apple Podcasts or another podcast platform. And that's awesome. You can totally continue to keep doing that. Earlier this year, I started putting my most recent episodes out on the Circa 19XX Land YouTube channel, so you can also listen out there. Now, my plan continues to be to put some videos out there, and I just have not been able to get organized to, enough to do it. You know, I'll get some ideas for some videos, and I'll even start kind of sketching some things out, and then I just don't get to it. I, I just can't seem to find the time, but... Uh, I don't know, someday, someday I'll do that. In the meantime, if you like this show, please do consider giving it a five-star review on the platform of your choice. And if you are out on the YouTube channel, if you would subscribe and like this one, that would be awesome too. One thing that makes it really difficult to be a regular listener to this program is the irregularity with which I put episodes out there. But regardless of whether you leave a review or subscribe, I hope that you'll continue to seek out this show. If you ring that bell notification out on YouTube, you'll always know when I put something out. It's a great comfort to me to know that I'm not the only person alive that likes this old musty stuff that we explore on this show. <laughs> Now, 
In our last episode, I set up a cliffhanger. If you tuned in, you might remember that I broke the zipper on one of my internal compartments of my new CalPAC suitcase the very first time I unzipped it in my hotel room in Newport. So in my last episode, I talked about my trip to Newport. I broke a zipper on one of the compartments, not not the outside zipper on the suitcase. That really would have been tragedy. But uh, no, I, I broke a zipper on one of the compartments. I talked to the CalPAC customer service and they were very nice. And they, they said, you know, as soon as we get this suitcase back in, because it had been out of stock, as soon as we get it back in, we will send you a replacement. And at the time that I recorded the last episode, you know, there was still a question in my mind as to whether or not that would really happen, especially because I wasn't entirely sure. I knew when they were going to get the suitcases back in. They had said August, but you never know. Now, I know that you haven't been able to rest comfortably with the uncertainty of this whole situation. So let's put this to rest right now. My replacement suitcase arrived <laughs> last week. Well done, CalPAC. And they told me to keep the other suitcase. I mean, that compartment won't close. But aside from that, the suitcase is still usable. So I was pretty impressed with their handling of that situation. I'm sure I don't need to mention that CalPAC does not sponsor this show. I'm just a small little customer. Uh, but uh, anyway, CalPAC, well done. I have to get to one more thing before we move on to our main topic, and that is movies. Okay, so do you remember the first movie that you ever saw in a theater? I do. I remember it vividly. You know what it was? It was the original Poseidon Adventure, and I saw it with my parents at the Chief Drive-In in Topeka, Kansas. That left such an impression on me, I can tell you. I must have been four or five. So I, I think the way that the drive-in movie theater worked back then was the movies would be in the regular theaters. And once they had kind of done their run, like maybe the following year or maybe months later, they would then show at the chief drive-in. But anyway, we were there at the chief drive-in watching the Poseidon Adventure. And I just thought it was the most amazing thing I had ever seen. Now, for those of you who don't know the story, the Poseidon was a fictional cruise ship. It was an old cruise ship that was making its last passage. They were, um, oh goodness, I forget. Where were they going? Mm, oh, I cannot remember. But anyway, they were making their last voyage, and then after that, uh, the ship was going to be retired. Okay, wait a minute. Hold on. Hold the phone, everybody. <laughs> I have to turn to my good friend Google here because this is going to drive me crazy. Um, okay. Last voyage of the Poseidon. Ah, okay. New York to Athens. New York to Athens. All right. Yes, that is correct. Okay, anyway, the ship encounters this enormous tidal wave that apparently resulted from an undersea earthquake, I think. Something happened. that, that There was a big storm, I, I remember that. Um, and then ultimately there was this huge wave, and they could see this wave coming in the distance. Not the passengers, but the, the ship's captain and, and the crew. They could see this ginormous tidal wave coming for the ship. And it slams into the Poseidon. And flips it over. So there's the ship upside down. And some of the people actually survived. Now, 
there was a big, you know, piece of the show there where it's like, well, what, what should we do? There were some survivors who wanted to stay where they were. There were other survivors that wanted to do other things. And then our little group, the group that we follow in the film, decided that they were going to make themselves up to the hull of the ship, which is now the top of the ship, because they feel that that's where their best chance for rescue is. You know, they know that water is coming in, that ship is going to sink. If they have any chance of someone rescuing them, they have to go to the top of the ship. And so this little group, they make their way up the ship. And, uh, you know, that's really what the whole the whole movie is about. I was completely mesmerized by this. So, you know, the, the first thing that I remember as a small child is that all of these characters were maneuvering through an upside down world. You know, so for example, there were tables that were hanging from the ceiling. There were light fixtures that were on the floor. You know, to a five-year-old, this is fascinating right? I mean, it's so super cool and amazing. But there were other scenes that were burned into my little brain um, as well. So the ship had encountered choppy seas before the big wave hit. So even before, you know, the storm or not the storm came along, the storm was in, in uh, progress. But before the ship, the, the tidal wave actually came and hit the ship, there was a storm and it, it was like two thirds of the passengers were sick they were seasick and that really made an impression on me because it's like wow two-thirds of the passengers that's like almost everybody was sick and uh, there was actually this one scene of this woman in bed and she was like oh you know she was just so sick and for some reason i mean when you're five this makes an impression right now the other thing that left a, an impression on me was the flip scene that scene in which the ship flips upside down. So all of the passengers were in the ballroom and they were celebrating New Year's Eve. So they were having a New Year's Eve party. Everybody was laughing and dancing. They were all dressed up in their finery and they were doing the countdown, you know, the, the uh, countdown to midnight and the new year. And then they're, you know, they're blowing horns and there's confetti and they're just having this amazing party. And then all of a sudden, the captain put the alarm on. Now, what the alarm was going to do, I don't know, because everything happened so fast, nobody had a chance to do anything. But uh, the alarm started sounding. The passengers are looking around. They're very puzzled. And then all of a sudden, the ship starts to rotate. And so people are flipping around and, you know, dishes are, are you know, flying around. And, I mean, it's just, it, it's like they're tumbling. They're, they're just tumbling through this ship as the ship um, goes upside down. And so, I mean, again, wow, that was just amazing to me. Okay, well, so there was one other scene that I vividly remember. And that was when the, that little group of survivors, they were getting close. They were getting close to um, where they were headed, you know, the, the bottom of the ship, which is now the top of the ship. But they had to swim through this passageway that had flooded. So they were trying to make their way, I believe, to the engine room is where they were going because the hole was the thinnest there. So they figured, you know, if, if rescuers were going to cut the hole open, it would be there in, at the engine room. So they're heading there, but they, they encountered this passage that's underwater. And so in order to get there, they have to swim through all this stuff in this corridor to get to that engine room. Dramatic, dramatic scene. And you know, the special effects were really amazing in this film. I mean, this was what, 1972? And there was no CGI back then. And I guess, you know, from what I what I uh, heard on the internet is that the actors did a lot of their own stunts too, which was pretty cool. I mean, these were not all young actors, so it's amazing that they were able to do so much of the physical work for the, their roles. Okay, now why do I bring this up? <laughs> well, because I saw that movie again last night, and I hadn't seen it since I was a kid. 
So what did I think of the movie the second time around? You know, sometimes you see something as a kid and you think it's amazing and then you see it as an adult and it's less amazing. So what did I think? Well, I loved it. That is still a cool movie. Now, apparently I am one of the only ones that feel that way. I went out and I was reading some reviews and I guess the critics all thought it was pretty hokey, but I just love it and I still do. Now, something that I didn't remember that is pretty much um, a, a feature of the entire movie is that the camera rocked the whole time. So, you know, even, even during the ballroom party scene, um, you know, when the, uh, the doctor was making a, a cabin call for one of the passengers who was sick, um, you know, and, and also when the survivors were making their way to the engine room, the, the camera was gently swaying, kind of rocking back and forth. And, you know, I was thinking about this, watching it on my television, was not really a big deal. And certainly if you're in the open air of a drive-in, it wouldn't have had much of an effect. But I'm thinking if you're sitting there in a theater and, you know, dark in theater, you're watching this film and it's constantly rocking, um, that creates a little bit of, I don't know, disorienting feeling. I thought it was pretty clever. I mean, it kind of gives you the feeling that you're on the ship right there with those passengers. But uh, I don't remember that from when I was a kid. Interesting, interesting little uh, uh, factor there. Okay, so the Poseidon Adventure had an all-star cast. One of my favorites was in it, Ernest Borgnine. I love Ernest Borgnine. Uh, who else? Let's see, Gene Hackman, Red Buttons, Stella Stevens, Shelley Winters, Roddy McDowell, Jack Albertson, um, Leslie Nielsen, they were all in it. Carol Lindley played the ship singer. And I had always thought that this was her only film you know, she was so pretty and she was young, you know, she was one of the survivors. And I thought when I was a little girl, I thought, oh, she's so pretty. And, and I'd never seen her in a, any other film. So I always kind of assumed that she was kind of a one hit wonder. You know, Poseidon Adventure was a huge hit. And I, I don't know what else she did other than that. Well, no, she was not a one-hit wonder. It turns out she had already been a very successful model and movie star before Poseidon Adventure came around. So, uh, wow, who knew? Now, I remember being really disappointed when my mom told me that she didn't actually do the singing in that film. So there was a, a song, The Morning After, that uh, she sang, and it became almost a secondary theme song for the film, but she didn't really sing it. She just kind of lip synced to a real singer. And my mom had told me that. And I was so disappointed for some reason. I don't know why. But anyway, um, the film was a huge financial success. It had a budget of $5 million. And it ended up making $160 million. It also earned eight Oscar nominations. One of those nominations, incidentally, was for Best Dramatic Score, and I do love the score for this film. Guess who, who the composer was? Now, let's, let's put the puzzle pieces together. We have a huge blockbuster, big film with special effects. Who else could have been the composer but John Williams? Yes, John Williams. I mean, is there any big blockbuster film in the last 50 years that he hasn't scored? Anyway, the original Poseidon Adventure is streaming for free right now on YouTube, which is where I saw it. So if you haven't seen this one, check it out. I think it's really fun. There is a message in this movie also. I mean, it's not all just exciting adventure. You know, there's a little bit of a message in here. Now, I mean, there is also some kind of bad theology. You know, you don't really look to Hollywood for uh, sound theological guidance. But uh, beyond that, if you look beyond that, it does have a great message, and that message is that life is precious. There were several junctures along the way where passengers had to choose. You know, they had to make a choice between life and death of going on or giving up. Um, and one of the messages, is, messages of this film is that life is precious and that it's always worth fighting for. That's great stuff. Good message. Okay, so here we are, halfway into the show, and we haven't even arrived at our main topic yet. Well, that's how we do things here in Circa 19XX land. We meander. 
Isn't that a great word? Meander. We follow a winding course. Why not? What's our hurry? <laughs> Speaking of words, that's really our subject tonight. We're going to have a little vocabulary lesson. Have you ever wondered what the difference is between glass and crystal? What about Art Deco and Art Nouveau? When is something considered vintage and when is it antique? What's the difference between perfume and cologne? Well, we're exploring a few pairs of things, things that are often confused with each other. Now, for this next segment, I'm going to pull together some of my notes. So yes, I am learning right along with you. So while I do that, why don't we have a little musical break and then we'll dive in. Now, I got the idea for our show tonight from an unlikely direction, a project that I'm working on completely outside of the borders of Circa 19XX land. This has to do with my day job, right? So I'm developing a new coaching course. And early in the course, I make a distinction between training and coaching. Now, these two things overlap considerably, and yet they're different things. I think these distinctions are important. So the way I define training, for example, is facilitating the acquisition and mastery of new skills. Coaching, on the other hand, is the further development of existing skills. These distinctions matter because they affect our approach and our strategy. So that got me to thinking about other things, things that are like training and coaching that share common qualities, but are distinctly different. 
you know, like glass and crystal. From a distance, they look the same, and they do have some qualities in common, and yet they're different, and that difference affects value and price. So tonight we're going to examine similarities and differences of these pairs of things, and I mentioned these before our musical break. Glass and crystal, antique and vintage, Art Deco and Art Nouveau, and cologne and perfume. Ah, what's that? That is the sound, my friend, of crystal chimes. If those were glass chimes, they'd sound totally different. They'd sound duller. They wouldn't ring or reverberate. The sound test is actually one of the ways that you can differentiate crystal from plain old glass. Now, crystal is one of those things that I feel like I can generally distinguish from glass, but I always kind of base my judgment on weight. Crystal feels heavier. And... Clarity. So crystal is clear, as in <laughs> crystal clear, right? We've heard that before. Glass can be a little cloudier. Now think of depression glass. Depression glass is beautiful, but that crystal clarity just isn't there. There's always kind of a little dull cloudiness to it. We have to remember that depression glass was mass produced. It was distributed for free as premiums with staples like oatmeal. By the way, can you imagine buying oatmeal and finding a beautiful serving dish inside? <laughs> How awesome! <sighs> anyway, I digress. So that, you know, that was very inexpensive glass. It was free. If we're comparing that to crystal, well, crystal's going to be a lot costlier. But are there other differences between crystal and glass besides weight, clarity, and sound? I mean, what exactly is crystal? Well, let's turn to a scientist for answers. I found an article on the West Texas A&M website written by physics professor Dr. Christopher Baird that talks about crystal and kind of explains what it is. He writes, Crystal glass is not made of crystal at all. The naming of certain types of glass as crystal is a confusing and inaccurate historical tradition. A crystal is any material that has its molecules aligned spatially into regularly repeating patterns. Metals, ceramics, salts, ice, sugar, rocks, those are all crystals. Crystal glass is not, in fact, crystal at all. So, in fact, the term crystal glass is a pure oxymoron. By definition, glasses are materials that have their molecules unordered. In other words, the very definition of glass is a material that is not a crystal. So what is crystal glass if not crystal? Traditionally, crystal glass was just regular glass where the calcium is replaced with lead oxide. A more accurate name, therefore, is lead glass. Okay, sidebar, let's step away from the article just for a moment. This kind of makes sense, right? Because we sometimes still talk about crystal as leaded glass. I never really knew what that meant. Okay, anyway, back to the article. Adding lead to glass raises its index of refraction. The index of refraction measures the amount that a material bends light. Materials with a higher index of refraction sparkle more because they bend the light more. One of the materials with the highest index of refraction is diamond. That's why diamonds sparkle so much. Adding lead to glass makes it look more like a diamond. Hence, lead glass became identified as crystal-looking glass, which got shortened to crystal glass. In this way, adding lead to glass allows an artist to make a candle holder or a wine cup that looks like diamond without actually needing to use diamond, which would be prohibitively expensive. Sidebar, but super cool. Um, can you imagine candle holders made of diamond? <laughs> what a dream! Okay, back to the article. Adding lead also makes the glass easier to work with so that more intricate designs can be cut into the glass. Now in our modern day, lead is recognized to be poisonous to humans. So crystal glass actually has barium or zinc now instead of lead. Wow, so this is news. I wonder if that means you shouldn't consume beverages or food contained by antique lead crystal. Maybe it's better to just display those pieces instead of using them. 
Now I encounter both glass and crystal all the time in my antiquing adventures. And if you go antiquing, I'm sure you do too. So let's look at how to tell the difference. Luxury online retailer Scully & Scully has a five-point checklist for identifying crystal from glass. Number one, they say to tap the piece gently with your fingernail and listen for an enduring sound. The greater the lead content, the longer the tone. Glass, on the other hand, makes a clunking noise. Crystal sounds like reverberated ringing. Number two, lightly run a wet finger in a circular motion around the rim. If it's crystal, you'll be able to hear a subtle tone emanating from it. Number three, with a close eye, inspect the sharpness or smoothness of the cut. The smoother it is, the more likely it's crystal. Glass tends to have sharper cuts and will also have a thicker rim than crystal. Number four, hold the piece up to a light or under the sun. Crystal will refract light on the spectrum much like a prism to create a rainbow effect. Glass with more than 35% lead will actually sparkle. And five, crystal will feel heavier in weight when contrasted with the weight of glass around the same size. Okay, so now we know. By the way, I have a very small collection of crystal vases and trinket boxes from Tiffany's. They're just beautiful. And each one came in that iconic turquoise blue Tiffany box with a white satin ribbon. Now, I didn't buy any of these things. These were service awards from a company that I had been with for 17 years. You know, every so often we could either pick these beautiful crystal pieces from Tiffany's or we could choose a Visa gift card. I was one of the few that picked the crystal. And I did that because I would never in a million years buy myself crystal from Tiffany's. No, it would never happen. And now, years later, I have these beautiful pieces on prominent display in my home. I think I made the right choice. Okay, now that we know the difference between crystal and glass, why don't we take a look at Art Deco and Art Nouveau and see if we can learn the differences between those two. Now, I love both Art Deco and Art Nouveau, and normally I feel like I'm pretty good at telling those two styles apart. I can usually look at a piece and say, oh yes, this looks representative of Art Nouveau, but not always. I'm not an expert on this, and so sometimes those styles seem to overlap, and then I'm not so sure. Now, by the way, I've already done a piece on Art Deco here in the uh, Circa, 19, or, uh, Circa Sunday Night Show. If I go all the way back to episode number six, Egyptomania is the name of that episode, I kind of do a deeper dive into Art Deco. Now, I have to say a little something about Egyptomania. That is a really good episode, <laughs> if I do say so myself. If you haven't listened to that one, I would ask that you consider uh, going out there and listening. I'll put a clip in the, in the uh, show notes. The reason why I love that episode so much is, first of all, the subject matter is really fascinating. But secondly, that's the episode where I really learned a lot about sound effects. Yeah, there's a lot of storytelling in that episode, and I wanted to kind of bring the story to life, and I wanted some dimensional sound in there, and I wasn't really sure how to do it. And so that episode really represented a, a little class for me, a little individualized learning project for me on how to work with sound effects. I remember that episode took me forever. <laughs> I think the sound effects alone took me an entire weekend, but the end product was something that I was really proud of. So um, you might want to go out and, and take a listen. How's that for um, a shameless plug? Oh, well, sometimes you got to do that now and then. Anyway, here's what I know about Art Deco and Art Nouveau, and this won't take very long because I don't know a whole lot. Art Deco is a design style that features a lot of geometric shapes and angular patterns. There are a lot of sharp edges in Art Deco. It's very industrial looking. Art Nouveau, on the other hand, 
is loopier. It's organic looking. I, I see organic as a word that's used to describe Art Nouveau um, pretty frequently. So, you know, when you think Art Nouveau, you think curving, delicate florals, scenes drawn from nature, just very feminine, sensuous type of um, flowing, like vines and flowers and everything. I, I just love it. It's so feminine, so pretty. It really appeals to me. Now, I also think of Alphonse Mucha, who was a Czech artist that um, really popularized the Art Nouveau movement and it kind of helped establish it, uh, establish it as a style. Now, he was a Czech artist, and I was in Prague right before the pandemic again. I mean, I know <laughs> it's like everything was before the pandemic, but uh, I was in Prague, and I happened to be walking around, and I saw this um, art, art book sto uh, store, a, a bookstore that specialized in art books. And even from outside on the street, you could look into this shop, and you would see these really long, gigantic Mooka prints hanging on banners from the ceiling. And then when you walked in the door, I mean, you could buy all kinds of things. You could buy uh, scarves. You could buy tote bags with Mooka prints on them. You know, hometown hometown artist makes good. So, uh, you know, it's all things Alphonse Mooka there at that uh, bookstore. But you know who else I, I kind of associate with Art Nouveau? And I probably shouldn't because I don't know if he's really associated with Art Nouveau, but William Morris is a, is a textile designer, and I think he also designed wallpaper, too. And his patterns are very curvy and flowy, and they just make me think of Art Nouveau, although I believe he, he lived and died earlier than Art Nouveau came along. I mean, I think he, maybe maybe his work was a precursor perhaps to Art Nouveau. I don't know, because I see some similarities there. I have a set of bookmarks that are in the William Morris print, and they're just so pretty, and I love them. They're, they're again, very floral, very organic looking, and very feminine looking. Now, if you are someone who knows a lot about art, you're probably screaming at your device right now because I'm probably getting all these names and everything wrong. <laughs> I am not an expert. I'm not an art expert. I just know things that I like, and every now and then I pick up a little something here and there. I'm not saying it's accurate. I'm just saying I pick up things here and there. But uh, anyway, you know, if we if we look at furniture, for example, that is in the Art Nouveau style, oh, it's so pretty. I just saw an etagere at an antique shop the, the other day. And it was so beautiful. It was also very expensive. I was looking at it because I would love to own this thing. But it was so delicate. You know, there were multiple shelves where you could put like knickknacks and things. And there were some mirrors in the background. But it had these, these very thin curving pieces of wood holding up each of the shelves in this etagere. And it, it looked so delicate. It looked like all you would need to do is kind of poke it with your finger and it would just break. <laughs> so beautiful though. Oh my goodness. Really pretty. Okay, so that exhausts the knowledge that I have about Art Nouveau, and I really don't know much more about Art Deco either. So I'm going to turn to an expert. Here is an article that is on the Collector.com website, and they're going to give us a little lesson on those two movements. Here's what they have to say. Art Nouveau and Art Deco are two revolutionary art and design movements that took hold during the late 19th and early 20th century. Beyond their similar sounding name, they share many parallels. Both movements came from Europe, and each responded in their own ways to the Industrial Revolution. They both also arose from relatively humble beginnings, eventually spreading throughout the entire world and forever changing the cultural landscape. Both movements also saw the arts as indivisible, and their styles spread across a huge array of different disciplines, from book illustration and painting to architecture, stained glass, and jewelry. Because of these overlaps, it can be easy to confuse the two styles. We can recognize the Art Nouveau style by its ornately organic, oh, there we go, see, organic, ornately organic flowing shapes and forms. 
These are usually elongated and exaggerated to heighten their dramatic impact. Nature was a definitive source of inspiration, with many designers imitating the curves and lines of plants and flowers. Seamlessness and continuity were important Art Nouveau concepts drawn from nature, reflecting Art Nouveau's wider desire to seamlessly connect all forms of visual and applied arts. The whiplash curl is the number one defining feature of Art Nouveau, and we see it appearing time and time again in the movement's most famous works of art and design. The whiplash curl is an ornamental, sinuous, S-shaped curve, and its bold, confident shape marked a radical departure from the conventions of the past. In fact, it became a symbol of artistic freedom, echoing the liberating spirit of the Art Nouveau movement. Now, sidebar, I do know about these curves, but I didn't know there was a name for them. Whiplash curl. Okay, back to the article. In contrast with Art Nouveau's decadently flowing lines, Art Deco is typified by an entirely different aesthetic, one of angular shapes and high polished surfaces. Inspired by technology, it echoed the language of industry, with vertical lines, zigzags, and rectilinear shapes. Art Deco also made use of the latest in high-tech materials, such as stainless steel, aluminum, and glass, often polished to a high sheen to emphasize an entirely modern look. Interestingly, Art Deco also looked to much older references, particularly the faceted architecture of Babylon, Assyria, ancient Egypt, and Aztec Mexico. Now you know why I included Art Deco in my Egyptomania episode. All right, back to the article. Although they're now recognized as international style trends, Art Nouveau and Art Deco each have roots in different locations. The beginning of Art Nouveau is often traced back to rural England and the arts and crafts movement that placed an emphasis on plant forms and traditional craftsmanship. Okay, um, sidebar again. So William Morris, I think, was from England. And I think he was part of that arts and crafts movement. So maybe that's where there's sort of a tie in there. I don't know. Again, if you're an expert on this, you're probably dying right now. But anyway. <laughs> okay, so back to the article. Um, Art Nouveau later spread into Austria before spreading across Europe and reaching the United States. Art Deco, by contrast, was founded by Hector Guimard in Paris and later spread across Europe and the United States, hitting a high point in the Jazz Age era of 1930s New York. The timings of each movement were also quite distinct. Art Nouveau came first, lasting roughly between 1880 and 1914. Art Deco came later, after World War I. Now, this distinction is important politically because Art Nouveau was all about whimsical romance and escapism in a pre-war society. After the war, it no longer seemed to suit the spirit of the times. Art Deco, instead, was a post-war celebration of the end of the conflict, a hard-edged style of modernism for a new era, one that was filled with jazz music, flappers, and party fever. <laughs> yes, that's in the article. Okay, so to recap, Art Nouveau came first, and it's characterized by organic curving lines drawn from nature, that whiplash curl that we learned about. Art Deco drew on technological advancements and ancient artifacts, and it's angular and characterized by geometric shapes, also polished surfaces. Now, I only have one Art Nouveau piece in my home, and it's one of my all-time favorites. Years ago, I bought an old fish tank stand that has these curving decorations on it. Now, I, I don't think I have a single Art Deco item, if you can believe that. So, um, okay, so you can deduce then probably what my favorite is between the two. Do you think I favor Art Deco or Art Nouveau? Yeah, Art Nouveau. It's, it's pretty, it's feminine, it's whimsical, it's romantic. Um, Art Deco was a little modern for my, for my taste. I do like it, but it's not my favorite. I think between the two, it's Art Nouveau all the way. It's pretty, feminine, and just lovely. Thank you.
Okay, so imagine that you are at an antique fair and you find a beautiful trinket box. You know it's old. You know this is not something that was made recently. But is it antique or is it vintage? Are those two things the same? Well, I've had my own definitions for those two things for a while, but honestly, I don't know where I got my ideas about this or if I just completely made this up on my own. So I've always thought that antique referred to anything 100 years or older. Actually, I do know where I got that. Um, long ago, I interviewed an antique dealer and that's what he told me. He, he'd been in antiques for many decades and he said anything that's 100 years old or older is considered an antique. Okay, so that's where I got that. That just came to my mind. Okay, but what about vintage? Does it mean anything that is newer than 100 years is vintage? I don't know. I, I guess so. I mean, I, I think in my mind, I always sort of associate vintage with being like 50 years old, mid-century kind of, I think, vintage when I think mid-century. Okay, well, am I right? Let's look it up. I'm going to have to do another little piece of research here on Google because um, I meant to do this before I sat down at the microphone and um, I forgot to. <laughs> this is a really professional show that we've got going on here as you can see. Um, but I'm going to do a quick Google search because I'm sure there are a million articles out here, a million resources. Let me see the difference between antique and vintage. All right, yes, there's a million articles out here, but we need an authority. Who sounds like an authority? Oh, here we go. Martha Stewart. Of course, Martha Stewart has the answer, right? We can trust her. Okay, so hold on. Let me pull up the article here. This is from the Martha Stewart website. Okay, it looks like I might be right here. The term antique refers to something 100 years or older. Furniture, works of art, jewelry, rugs and carpets, everyday objects like housewares and accessories can all be antiques. What about vintage? Okay, hold on. I need to scroll down because there's a bunch of stuff here. Okay, vintage items, on the other hand, are much younger. Typically prior to 1999. What? What? So if you have something from 1999, it's vintage? I don't know. I guess I'm just getting old. That just seems like not very long ago. Okay, so vintage items are much younger, typically prior to 1999, though often from much earlier, like the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Clothing, jewelry, watches, accessories, housewares, and furniture are all common vintage items. Other media, including postcards, periodicals, photography, vinyl records, cassette tapes, VHS tapes, and even electronics like cameras and gaming systems are also popular vintage items with collector's appeal. Okay, so anything younger than 1999. Okay, so let me take a look at when this article was written. This article was written in 2020. So basically, vintage is anything that is at least 20 years old. So that probably means that most of our houses are full of vintage stuff. <laughs> Who knew? Now we are going to explore the differences between perfume and cologne. And for this one, I sort of feel like um, maybe I'm the last person in the world to know what the difference is. I'm starting to think now that I've done a little bit of, of looking into what the differences are that everyone in the world already knows what the differences are, but I did not. <laughs> 
So, you know, you learn. That's one of the great things about doing this podcast. I learn stuff just along with you. So, um, yes, there is a difference uh, between cologne and perfume. And actually, there's so many different things, right? There's eau de toilette. What's that? You know, um, eau de parfum. Is that the same thing as perfume? Gosh, there's so many scent options out there. So we're going to kind of drill down here and take a look at them all. So what is the key difference between perfume and cologne? Well, this one is pretty easy. So cologne is typically associated with scents marketed to men. No, I did not know that. (laughs) I mean, I knew that there was like aftershave cologne, I guess, and that kind of thing. But I thought, I thought cologne was also you know, a type of scent for women. I just honestly did not know that. Okay, so perfume is just the opposite. It's typically marketed to women. Now, it's the most expensive of all the scent options. It's the most concentrated. It lasts the longest. It tends to be a little bit oilier than some of the other scent options. They tend to be a little bit uh, less oily and and more uh, liquidy. I mean, perfume is liquidy too, but it it just has more essence of the scent in it and therefore is a little bit oilier. Okay, so let's kind of go through these. So there's Eau de Parfum, which contains 15 to 20% fragrant essence. So whatever that scent is, it contains about 15 to 20%. Perfume, in contrast, is about 20 to 30% fragrance. Now, Eau de Toilette is much lighter. It only has about 5% fragrance. By the way, I always thought Eau de Toilette meant toilet water. (laughs) Yes, I'm wearing Chanel No. 5 toilet water. Thank you very much. Uh, No, that's not what it is. It's grooming water. Is that better than toilet water? I think it is. I think I'd rather wear grooming water than toilet water. But uh, anyway, speaking of Chanel number no. five, I did a little price comparison. So on the Chanel website, you can get 3.7 ounce bottles of Eau de Toilette for $90. The same package for Eau de Parfum is $106. Not a big difference there, but I would definitely go for the Eau de Parfum because it's got the stronger fragrance. Okay, so back to our original question. What's the difference between cologne and perfume? Well, again, cologne is marketed to men, perfume to women. Yes, I know I should have known that, but I didn't. We all are here to learn. Okay, so my hope with this segment is that you have some new trivia to impress your friends with. You know, stump your friends by tossing out whiplash curl in your next conversation and uh, let me know what happens. I want to tell you about a lovely book that I'm reading right now. I'm on kind of this Carol Houselander kick. I've always loved her writing. And, you know, if you do a Google search for Carol Houselander quotes, oh, you will just find the most lovely faith-filled sentiments that, oh, I don't know, they just kind of help you put things into perspective. Now, I can hear you already saying, Jennifer, (laughs) who in the world is Carol Houselander? Well, she was a British artist, a writer, and a poet, and she wrote about faith and mystical experiences that she had throughout her life. She was born in 1901 and died in 1954, so, you know, she's right smack in the middle of circa 19xx land. But, you know, I really like her writings, particularly about work and spirituality, combining those two things, because, you know, sometimes you go to work every day, you get mired in projects and just day-to-day stuff, and sometimes it feels like what you're doing is so meaningless. Well, her perspective is that work is a form of prayer, and it's just beautiful. And, and it just makes you think about work in an entirely different way. Well, anyway, the book that I'm reading is Carol Hauslander, The Essential Writings by Wendy M. Wright. And there are some wonderful passages here about relaxation of all things. Who couldn't use more information about relaxation, right? I mean, we all want to relax. 
So um, there's some passages here about relaxation that I just love, and I wanted to share this with you. So um, here is uh, some writing from Carol Hauslander on relaxation. And these are different passages, so I'm, I'm excerpting some things here and there. Just now, the cat is lying by the fire in a state of complete abandonment. He knows nothing and cares nothing for war. Oh, sidebar, she wrote this during the war. <laughs> okay, he knows nothing and cares nothing for war. He has unlimited confidence in me. He's sure that I'll always feed him and warm him and house him. We have a lot to learn from the cat. At present, we're bristling, squinting, stiffening, even more than usual, but we're always tense, even in times of peace. My cat is a tabby. Just now he was in the garden when a black cat came loping along the garden wall, a very unpleasant fellow, I must admit, definitely marked by the underworld, and my tabby became very anxious. He rushed to the window, his pink mouth wide open, his face rattled with fear. I let him in, and no sooner had he jumped on my lap than he relaxed. He went limp and indicated by various signs known to me that he wanted his ears scratched. That done, he went to sleep. This is a lesson in prayer. There are many ways of prayer. To lift up the heart and mind to God covers a huge range. There's prayer like that of Moses when he lifted up his arms and held them up, straining and agonizing before God. There's the prayer which Christ describes in one of his parables, which could be called the prayer of importunity, a continual hammering and beating on the door of heaven until we get what we want, and many others. But now, with such great anxiety pressing upon us, the prayer in which we can relax is surely among the most creative. We certainly should pray all the time, praying with our hands, our bodies, our will, our acts. But in order to delight God and to build up the peace of our souls, besides the prayer in which we offer ourselves to God, should be the prayer in which we let God give himself to us. We should learn to receive the love of God in silence and joy. That is what is meant by relaxing. There should be, even in the busiest day, a few moments when we can close our eyes and let God possess us. He's always present, always giving us life, always round us and in us, like the air we breathe. There should be moments at least when we become more conscious of his presence, when we become conscious of it as the only reality, the only thing that will last forever. I ought to be able to treat God as my cat treats me. Well, that just seems like a perfect place to leave things. I hope you enjoyed spending some time with me this evening. Probably at this point, you're either asleep or completely distracted by things that you're multitasking on, which is perfectly fine. If, though, you thought this episode was tolerable, please do leave the show a five-star review on Apple or any app where you listen to your podcast. Or, if you'd like, you can subscribe to the Circa 19XX Land YouTube channel. Wow, would I appreciate that. We're ready to begin another work week. Oh, no. And if that doesn't exactly make you smile, no worries, because another Friday will be here before we know it. Have a great week, and bye for now.